Good evening, everyone. Uh, could I give you all a very warm welcome to Iron Hall on this our second night of our Easter convention. Those that are gathered in, indeed those listening uh, online, uh, elsewhere in the nation and maybe indeed across the world as well, you're all very welcome. And we trust that we'll know the Lord's blessing upon this very momentous uh, evening as we remember the one who remembered us upon the cross of Calvary. We're going to start off tonight with a few choruses, and uh, if we could just remain in our seats for these. <clears throat> and the first one will appear uh, on our screen soon. What kind of love is this? And we're here to remember the love that the Father has shown upon us. So uh, let's just stay seated and sing this through. Positions, and we're going to stand, if you're able, for our opening hymn tonight, which is, O Christ, what burdens. Standing to sing.
Well, tonight, of course, is Good Friday. And tonight we remember the very Lamb of God that went to the cross of Calvary to take the consequences of your sin and indeed mine. We call it Good Friday. And let us pray that for everyone here, in a spiritual sense, it would be a Good Friday. For maybe some, even here tonight, or listening into this service, that it might be their best Friday of all, when they might come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We want to thank, of course, Paul Ferguson, uh, who is our speaker over the course uh, of the uh, convention here. And uh, also it's good to have Stephen Anderson uh, with us this evening too. And we look forward to his ministry and song a little later. But let's just prepare our hearts for worship now. Let's just bow our heads and come to the throne of grace in prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we gather to worship this evening and we pray that we would desire to worship in spirit and in truth as thy word commands us to. That we indeed would have a, a godly reverence and fear as we come to the throne of grace now. We give Thanks for that access which we have to the Father through Jesus the Son, that we can give him all the glory for the great things that he hath done. And Father, we realize that we meet here tonight and we can give thanks for many things. We can give thanks for the health which just enables us to be here tonight. We give thanks for our families and our loved ones. We give thanks for our church family here in the Iron Hall or Templemoor Hall or wherever it may be. We give thanks for the privilege for those of us who are saved being part of God's family. And we realize tonight more than anything else we should give thanks for the cross and for the one that went to it on our behalf. We realize that without the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there would simply be no hope for any of us this evening. That there would be no salvation through any amount of our own works or accomplishments or merits. But we praise God this evening that it is possible to be saved by grace through faith. We praise God this evening indeed that we do not worship one that remains upon a cross. We do not worship one that remains in a tomb. But rather we come to worship the risen Savior the one who died for us while we were yet sinners and the one who rose triumphantly from the grave has ascended to heaven and as we're told in scripture is now seated at the right hand of God the Father interceding on our very behalf. Oh Father, what a privilege tonight it is to be not just in one another's presence, good as that is, but more importantly, to be in the Lord's presence. We pray for all aspects of our service this evening. We give thanks for our brothers, Paul and Stephen, being with us again. We give thanks, first and foremost, for saving them from the consequences of sin. For indeed, calling them uh, into different forms of ministry for thy glory. 
and for equipping them in that. And we pray that as they would come to minister in song and to preach the riches of thy word, that they might feel at ease here with friends and family ultimately in a spiritual sense. We pray that the words they sing and indeed proclaim from thy word would be words through the power of the Holy Spirit that would penetrate our souls. We pray that we would be challenged this evening. We pray indeed that we would be convicted and by the grace and power of God changed this evening. For we realize that the Lord Jesus Christ does not just give us a new start in life. He ultimately gives us a new life to start. Father, we just pray for each and every soul that is gathered in this building. We realize that we are all different in looks, in personality, in age, in, in backgrounds. But yet, ultimately, we are all the same. For no matter who we are, we are all sinners that have come short of the glory of God. We pray tonight that as we consider the cross, that we would remember why the Lord Jesus went there. We would pray indeed that we would focus upon the one who is the man of sorrows. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a saviour. Indeed, lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven, exalted high. Hallelujah. What a saviour. We pray that as we listen to the voices in song and the voice in public ministry, that while we would enjoy them, we know that it would be their desire and our desire that we would hear ultimately the Lord's voice. So speak to our hearts this evening, we pray. For we ask this in the Saviour's name and for his glory. Amen. Well, as I said, it's great uh, to have uh, Stephen Anderson uh, with us tonight. And I'm going to call upon uh, Stephen now to come to the front and to minister in song. Thanks very much, Stephen. Good to be with you here again uh, in the Iron Hall. Um, to be honest, this is my favorite time of the year to sing. Um, any gospel singer worth their salt um, should always be singing of the crosswork of Christ. So it's very easy to find a piece uh, or a few pieces to sing on an occasion like this. And that's the theme that you'll see throughout my pieces tonight. I'm going to start with a song called Alas and Did My Savior Bleed. Oh, no. 
throne and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there receive my sight and now I am happy all the day. Thus might I hide my blushing face while his dear cross appears. Dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt my where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Help me, dear Savior, thee to own and
as Pilate tried? Or will you choose him whate'er betide? Vainly you struggle from him to hide. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with him? Well, we'd like to thank uh, Stephen very much indeed for those very appropriate and challenging uh, pieces in song to us tonight. Just a few things by way of announcement now. Uh, first of all, just on behalf of Templemore Hall Assembly, uh, I'd like to thank uh, those in the Iron Hall uh, for hosting uh, the event and uh, indeed for all the organisation uh, that uh, goes into it. You'll appreciate events like this just don't happen. Uh, there's many hours of preparation uh, behind uh, the scenes. And uh, so uh, we just, for all of us in Templemore Hall, uh, would like to thank the leadership and those from uh, the Iron Hall uh, for all the preparations that have went into uh, this weekend. I think the uh, Easter Convention has been running together uh, for about 70 years or so. Uh, now, naturally, I haven't seen all 70 years, uh, um, but some here have, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, we've certainly appreciated the fellowship uh, over those years. There's also some other people I, I want to thank as well. Uh, obviously, it goes without saying, uh, we want to thank our, our preacher, uh, Paul Ferguson. Uh, those of us that were here last night thoroughly enjoyed his ministry. And we trust that we'll be blessed again uh, this evening. And obviously I want to thank Stephen as well for his ministry and song. But there are some people sometimes uh, that, that can be a bit forgotten about. And uh, we need to remember that the focus sometimes just tends to be uh, upon the, the pulpit and the platform and who uh, is in it, and naturally so. Uh, but the reality is there's other people uh, up at the front uh, every night as well. Uh, so we just really want to thank the musicians uh, for uh, their work uh, each night. And also the technical people as well. Let's not forget about them uh, that they are enable the service to go out online and sort out all the microphones and all of that as well. So I just want to pay a tribute uh, to them as well. Now, one very important announcement, and that is that there is supper tonight. Uh, there is a supper uh, after um, the service this evening. It will not be in this building. Uh, it will be in the activity hall uh, so you just go out through the doors and, and turn right uh, and a few steps away uh, from there. You all, I'm sure, know uh, where that is. You're all very welcome uh, to wait behind uh, for supper afterwards. I hope you didn't eat too much tonight and you've left some room uh, for that. 
Uh, in relation to uh, the Sunday services, there'll be no meeting tomorrow uh, night, Saturday. Uh, but then there will be the Sunday services uh, as usual. Uh, Paul will be back to minister again here in the Iron Hall uh, at 11.30 a.m. And that will be uh, preceded uh, for those that come to the Lord's table at 10.30 uh, a.m., I believe. And uh, uh, also, uh, as is normally the custom over this last period of years, uh, there'll be Sunday morning Easter services in both fellowships. So uh, Paul will be the preacher here at 11.30 a.m. And God willing, I will be the preacher in Temple Moor Hall at 11 a.m. And then we're having a joint service together again on Sunday evening. And uh, notice the time of it will be 7 uh, p.m. Uh, 7 p.m. And again, uh, Paul uh, will be ministering at it, and uh, Alec will be back uh, to minister in song, God willing. One other announcement, and it concerns more food indeed, and that is, I believe, there's a, a barbecue taking place on uh, Tuesday, uh, Easter Tuesday. It's down in Tully Moor, and uh, I'm sure uh, that you're all very welcome. Uh, to attend that uh, if you wish to go. So I think those are all uh, the announcements uh, subject to the Lord's will as always. Well, but we're going to prepare our hearts now before we receive the message from God's word. So I'm going to ask you to stand uh, after the introduction uh, for our next hymn, which is How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
Thank you, Kyle, and thank you for the welcome to the Iron Hall and the Temple Moor Hall. I've never been to Temple Moor Hall, but uh, I've heard a lot about it. Tonight is a very special night for all of God's people gathered around the world as we remember the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think this is my second year in a row to have Easter in this country. I was nearly 20 years in Singapore, and Good Friday is a very special time of the year in Singapore, and all the churches are packed with people in Singapore on Good Friday, and unbelievers come in to find out what is going on with this person, Jesus Christ. What does the cross mean? I think we used to have two services to get the number of people that wanted to come in every Good Friday and every Resurrection Sunday morning. And last night we looked at the king in the garden. Tonight we want to see the king on the cross. Next Sunday morning, God willing, we look at the king in the tomb. And then on Sunday night, we want to look at the other side perspective and see the king on the throne. Because Jesus is coming again. And this time he's not coming to die. This time he's coming to reign and to rule on this earth for all of eternity. And he's going to rule from the city of Jerusalem. And that's why there's such turbulence and chaos and confusion stirred up by hell against that place because the devil knows that Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back to the land of Israel and he's coming back to the Mount of Olives and he's coming back to the city of Jerusalem because the Bible says that's where he'll come. But we'll see that on Sunday night. Tonight we want to speak about the two sermons or two areas of messages that the devil hates the most. The first area is the cross and the resurrection. And of course, the second topic or area that you can preach on that the devil hates the most is the second coming of Jesus Christ because both of them reflect his greatest defeats. Tonight we want to look at the cross and then on Sunday morning the resurrection. Many years ago, in the 18th century, a German artist called Karl Stenberg met a little gypsy girl. He was amazed by her beauty. He said to her, would you come and let me paint your portrait? She agreed to come and came into his studio. And as he was painting her portrait which eventually became the famous painting, The Dancy, Dancing Gypsy Girl. She spotted another portrait that he was painting of the crucifixion. And after she had stood for a while, she said to him, Sir, can I ask you a question? She says, The man that's kneeled on that cross must have been a very terrible individual. Sternberg looked at her, he said, no. In fact, he says, he was the very opposite. He was a good man. Indeed, he says he was the best man who ever lived because he died for mankind. The little gypsy girl, whose name was Pepita, turned to him and said, Sir, did he die for you? Carl Stenberg, who wasn't a believer, was so convicted by the question that it wouldn't leave him. 
And some days later, he made his way to a Christian gathering. And he heard the gospel. And he came to trust in the one who hung on the cross that day. Now let's turn to Luke's gospel, chapter 23. Uh, the crucifixion account is in all the gospel accounts and it's always difficult to decide which one because each of them give you something extra. But I like this one in Luke's gospel 23 in particular and verse 33 and it says, and there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. It's always interesting that verb, forgive, is in what we call the imperfect Indicating that Jesus kept repeating this. Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Forgive them. For they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding and the rulers also with them derided him saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. One of the malefactors which were hanged reeled on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands. I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. What words? Let's pause and ask the Lord's help. Our Father, we thank you that we are treading on the sacred ground of Calvary tonight. We're seeing the Savior pay the greatest price for our sins. We see his suffering. We see his shame. We see his willingness. We see his love. For sinners like us. And Lord it's so humbling. It's so. Magnifying of the grace of God. That we just marvel. At such a sight. Speak to us this evening. Exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. In our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. And may we leave here tonight saying, God has spoken to me. God has touched my life. And now I want to walk more like Jesus from now on. For we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Now this evening, we just want to take a little time to gather 
around the cross and see the Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago hanging on the cross. The King. The King on the cross. Now that day there were three men hanging on three crosses. One died for sin. One died in sin. And one died to sin. But the focus of our exposition this evening is the one who died for sin. The Lord Jesus Christ. And he's hanging on a tree. And on that tree is crushed into his brow the thorns. I mentioned last night of the sweat of the brow and how God ties all things together in Scripture because Adam made his living by the sweat of his brow. And the first Adam, he was in a garden and he sinned by taking the fruit of the tree. The first Adam caused the thorns. But the last Adam, he took the thorns. And pierced his brow with the thorns. And he hung on the tree to pay the penalty of sin that the first Adam had brought into this world. And the Lord Jesus Christ was viciously beaten, spat upon, slapped. And then his hands and his feet were nailed to a wooden cross. And he was left, although it doesn't say here, you have to piece the various gospel accounts together, from the third hour to the ninth hour, six hours. He's going to hang there in shame and agony and humiliation. We want to just break down for a moment what he endured on that cross in those six hours of suffering. The first thing that he endured was the physical pain. You see, the cross was the most agonizing way to die. The Persians had said, was said to have invented the crucifixion of a criminal. But the Romans were said to have perfected it. And it was the most feared way to die because a person died in agony. Sometimes they hung on the cross for days. It was the most humiliating way to die and it was the most feared death that any person could endure. And Christ took it for you and for me. As we saw last night, he took that cup with his eyes open. He knew the consequence when he said, not my will, but your will. Nevertheless, I'll take the cup. There's no other way to procure salvation. Now what happens to a human when they hang on the cross? Well, there's the loss of blood. There's a loss of heat. There's extreme dehydration. All the cells of the body compete with one another like a civil war for fluids. It's agonizing. And when you come to the end, the tongue begins to swell up become thick and you can barely speak we discover that Christ cried I thirst when he was in the agonies of the cross physically it was the most painful way to die 
But then he endured not just the physical pain on the cross. He endured the emotional pain of the cross. We read even in this passage in verse 36, in verse 35, that there were large groups of people from different backgrounds mocking him, scoffing at him, blaspheming him as he hung on the cross. And then as he hung on the cross, he had to endure the pain, the emotional pain of betrayal by Judas. He had to endure the sense of betrayal by the other 11 disciples, how they all had left him, how he had poured his heart and soul for three and a half years into their lives and had done nothing but good to them and blessed them and even had forewarned them of the agony of the cross that would come and still they ran away and left him. Oh, what a betrayal. He had to endure the shame of hanging there naked. The humiliation of all that went with that before men. So he endured the physical pain. He endured the emotional pain. But the most difficult pain of all he had to endure was the spiritual pain. Because the Bible tells us that Christ was afflicted on the cross. Now wait for this. From heaven and from hell. Because all the demonic forces of hell gathered around the cross to assault him. And the psalmist says in Psalm 22, in one of the messianic psalms, gives us a little glimpse of the strong bulls of Bashan encompass or beset me around. So hell afflicted him on the cross. But even worse, even more painful was the punishment that heaven afflicted upon him. When God the Father looked on the Son and poured out his judgment and his wrath upon all the sins and the filth of humanity upon his son that night for six long hours. No wonder the father, when he looked at the son and saw all the cesspool of thousands of years of all the sins in thought, in word, in deed, that humanity has committed. When he looked down upon the sun, he turned his face away. Because God says in his word, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look upon iniquity. We cannot truly comprehend what it meant that day for Jesus Christ to hang for those six hours. Maybe we can have a little idea of physical pain. We have a little insight in life to spiritual pain, or not spiritual pain, emotional pain, when people betray us. But we certainly have no idea of what it is to face the wrath of God upon sin. And here on the cross, the unfallen man must take the punishment for fallen men. Here on the cross, the spotless one must take the punishment of the sinner. And Christ had no experience of dying, yet he would taste death for every man, the Bible says. Here he hung on the cross that good Friday to pay the price for your sin so that you don't have to pay the price. That's why it's a good Friday. 
Good Friday for us. You see, since our first parents fell in Eden, man has had this problem of sin. A problem he can't deal with. And a problem, let me say, he still can't deal with. You just go around Belfast and watch humanity try to live together and we discover the bitterness and the strife and the envy and the jealousy and the anger and the division is still there, isn't it? You don't have to go outside a home to see it. You see it in the home place. You see it in the workplace. And you see it even in the church. Man can't solve his problem. His greatest problem. The problem of sin. And Jesus Christ had to come that day. And endure the physical pain. And the emotional pain. And the spiritual pain. So that you and I. Could be free. So that you and I could be forgiven. Because our greatest need is forgiveness. Many years ago a missionary came to the land of India. As he arrived by ship at the dock. A great crowd of people gathered to see this foreigner come to their shores. And leading the group that were there gathered at the pier were a group of religious Hindus. And they said to this missionary, Sir, you have come a long way to tell us about your religion, your faith, Christianity. And here in India, we have millions of gods. And if you ever go to India, and I've been there, they worship everything, don't they? They worship the animals, particularly the cows. And the cows go up and down the streets. And I remember watching, and they'll put their hand on the cow as it passes to get a blessing. And even in the churches there, the cows come in and out off the streets. And nobody's allowed to touch them, or the locals go mad. These sacred animals, these gods. And these Hindu priests said to this missionary, we have millions of gods in India. And you've come to tell us about your God called Jesus. And here's our question for you. What can your God provide that all the millions of gods of India cannot provide? Now that's a good question, isn't it? And a good question should receive a good answer. And the missionary had a good answer. He looked at all of those Hindus and he said, listen. I can tell you in one word what my God can give that none of your gods can provide. And they all perked their ears. Just like you're doing right now. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, here's the word. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Because only Jesus, and Jesus only, can forgive sins. Because only Jesus went to the cross. And took the shame and took the humiliation and took the emotional pain and took the physical pain and took the spiritual pain for you and for me. Only Jesus. That's why in Christianity the cross is the center of our religion. Because without the cross there's no Christianity. Just an empty building. So let us never make light. Let us never ignore or dilute the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Always concerns me when God's people gather on the Lord's day 
to remember the death of Christ in his own appointed way. How many Christians don't even bother? They say, well, the dinner's on and I need to get home. And some of them are even saying, the EPL's on. Or the rugby's on. Or the sun is shining and I need to get home because I've got other things more important than to remember the death of Jesus Christ. Well, here's the question. Why did Jesus Christ endure the pain, endure the humiliation, endure the suffering? Was it because you and I were lovable? Was it because he looked and saw something good in us that attracted his attention? No, it was the very opposite. He went to the cross and endured the pain because there was nothing good in us. But because of one reason and one reason only. What's the reason? Well, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul was a man who was the enemy of Jesus Christ, who hated Jesus Christ, who hated Christianity with a passion. And he went on a journey to the city of Ephesus. It's a little city just off the coast of Western Turkey today. If you go to the ancient ruins of Ephesus, you can walk up and down the paved streets that are dug up by the archaeologists. And as you go up and down the main square of Ephesus today, you look to your left and you look to your right, and every other place is a temple to an idol. As you come down to the main part of the center, of Ephesus or ancient Ephesus there's the remains of a great library and then there's a sign from the library and it points to the brothel because immorality and idolatry just go hand in hand the apostle Paul went to that place and there were no Christians there that we know about and he went into that center of idolatry and immorality and he proclaimed the gospel and a great number were saved. From that church at Ephesus, which according to historians numbered in their thousands, missionaries were sent out all over what today we call Turkey. Years later, Paul wrote them a letter called the Epistle to the Ephesians. In that letter, he described to them their state before they met the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 1, he says, And you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sin, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had all our conversation or our behavior in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So you get a little insight. This is what they were like, full of idolatry, full of immorality, full of lust. full of wickedness, full of hell. Paul says, this is what you are like. Dead. But then we come to verse 4. You have that little conjunctive disjunctive. But God. What changed it all? God. Now why did God save those vile, wretched Gentiles and Jews that inhabited the city of Ephesus? Here's the answer. But God who is rich in what? Mercy. Mercy. 
for his great what? Love. And Paul adds himself in this. Wherewith he loved us. Why did Jesus go to the cross? Because of love. Not just love. His great love. Wherewith he loved us. And when did that love begin? Jeremiah tells us. Yea I have loved thee what? With an everlasting love. That's what the cross means. Kneels. Someone said, put him on the cross. But love kept him there. Not just love, his great love. His everlasting love. Oh, he could have come off the cross at any moment. He deserved to come off the cross at any moment. In fact, he told Peter, didn't he? In the garden of Gethsemane. He says Peter do you not know. That I could call down 12 legions of angels. To rescue me. At any moment. I'm not here in the garden of Gethsemane. As Judas and the soldiers approach. I'm not here because I have to be here. I'm not compelled to be here. I'm not here because I deserve to be here. I'm here, Peter, because of my great love. Wherewith I love thee. That's why Jesus hung on the cross. There's an old song, and I'm sure it's familiar to so many. And it says this, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Isn't that beautiful? When he was on the cross, I was on this mind. And you know, because of that, you are precious. You have eternal value. Now, I know the world that we live in doesn't see the children of God as precious or valuable. As I look down the congregation, I see many older folk here tonight. And going through our parliaments in across Europe is bills that are now coming in to do what they call assisted dying. It's a fancy title for saying getting rid of the old folk. Why do they want to get rid of the old folk? Because they see no value from them. God says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. God doesn't see old folk as insignificant or valueless. Every child of God, from the ones in the womb to those in the old people's home, are precious, have eternal significance, have eternal souls, Because Jesus Christ died for the young and the old. Many years ago, a French Christian scholar called Muritus in the 17th century fell ill. He was taken into hospital wearing clothes that Disguised his scholarly background. Rags. As he lay there, the doctors began to talk about his condition. And describing him as a worthless creature. And he sat up and he said this. It says, will you call me worthless? One whom Christ did not disdain to die for. Beautiful, isn't it? Who oh, every child of God is worth. And maybe you're here tonight and you say, I don't feel valuable. In the home that I live in, in the marriage that I'm in, in the circumstances that I'm in, in the workplace that I'm in, no one sees me as valuable. God sees you as valuable. 
God sees you as so valuable that he sent his son to the cross just to save your soul. And not only save your soul, bring it safely home to glory. Old W.P. Nicholson used to have two banners up in some of his crusades, and I love them. I think we should put them up in all our churches. And on one side of the pulpit, there's one sign that says, Jesus saves. And that's beautiful, isn't it? But on the other side of the pulpit, he had another banner up. Jesus keeps. Keeps. He doesn't just save and abandon. He keeps. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He says, I'll be with you right to your last breath. As the psalmist said in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Never leaves you. I go in and out of hospitals all the time. In the ICUs. You meet Christians there and some of them can become very downcast when they're left there. Sometimes they're abandoned on corridors for days. And one of the things I love to do is bring them to Psalm 23 and say to them, listen, when the ambulance men walk away and your family leave you and you're lying in the corridor and the people, there's noise going on, sometimes screaming going on, and you feel so alone. Remember this. You're not alone. Because there's one there who said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you right to the very end of the journey. Christian, today is a very sobering day. For us. Because it's a day that reminds us. If ever we needed reminded. Of what we owe the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure you're familiar with the story of Count von Sinzendorf. That European man. Of, from Moravia. Of royal descent. And how he went on a journey one day. To Dusseldorf in Germany, went into an art gallery and he saw a painting called Behold the Man. It's a picture of Christ on the cross by an Italian painter. And underneath the painting were these words inscribed All this, all this. I did for thee. What hast thou done for me? Well, that's a great question, isn't it? Because there's a lot of Christians here tonight. And we've taken time to belabor the point of what Christ suffered on the cross, the king on the cross for you. And here's the response that's now required. All this I have done for you. And what a sacrifice. What have you done for me? Count von Zinzendorf left that place under conviction of his sin. And he says, from now on, I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. He gathered a group of Christians around him and they formed a 24-hour prayer circle for the world. God began to send out one by one from their gathering missionaries and they went to every corner of the world and a number of them got on a boat to go to America. And there was a young man there on that boat full of his own self-confidence and self-righteousness. His name was John Wesley. A great storm hit the boat. Wesley was terrified to die because he didn't have the root of faith. 
As he looked at those Moravian Christians who weren't educated like him, an Oxford scholar, a fellow of Lincoln College, and he couldn't understand how can these poor, simple Christians not be afraid and I'm terrified to die. And he began to talk to them. How is it? And they told him, our faith is anchored to the work of Jesus Christ. And no matter what happens, we'll simply be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And through their witness and their example, Wesley made it back home to England and he made it to the cross and was saved. Some of those Moravians made their way to Northern Ireland. If you go to the little village of Grace Hill outside Balamina, you can see their church and the work of the Moravians. Great folk. All because Count von Zinzendorf heard the challenge that day. All this I have done for you. What have you done for me? Jesus Christ's death certificate became our birth certificate. Isn't that right? What was the saddest day give way to the gladdest day? Because Jesus Christ died for you and me so that we could go free. This evening as we finish, maybe let me issue one challenge to those who are unsaved. There's only one way to heaven and it's not found through the church. It's not found through the preacher or the priest or the prophet or any ritual. It's found through this one place, the cross. I quoted the old hymn last night, I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. Ne'er get sight of the gates of light. If the way of the cross I miss. If you miss the cross, you miss heaven. And if you want to go to hell, just walk past the cross. And you'll get there. But if you want to go to heaven, there's only one way. And it's through the cross. Many years ago, a man called George Bernard grew up in the state of Ohio in a very poor home. He was born in 1873. When he was a boy, he attended school, but his family were very poor. By the age of just 16, his father, who was a minor, passed away. George had to leave school and go down to work in the mines. And that produced a great crisis in his life. One day the Salvation Army came to his area and held a gospel campaign. And George Bernard was wonderfully converted. He said, I've got to serve the Lord. I may not have much. I may not be much. But I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He became a preacher. In the Methodist church. One day he was out preaching the gospel. And he'd been thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he had done on the cross. And a group of young people came to listen. As he was preaching in the open air. And they began to mock him. And sneer at the cross. George Bennard. He refused to be put off or intimidated. And he kept proclaiming the old rugged cross. Went home that night. 
And he thought about what had happened in that open air. And he took a piece of paper. And he took a pen. And he wrote these words. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. And we know the chorus, don't we? So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. That's why we continue to preach in the 21st century the old rugged cross. Because those who come by the cross one day receive the crown. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for what our ears have heard tonight, what our eyes have read in your word of the greatness of the cross. The king who came to go through the garden and then to the cross. We thank thee that he didn't just stay on the cross. He accomplished salvation there. And he cried with his last words, it is finished. The price is paid. He lay in the tomb for three days. And Good Friday gave way to Resurrection Sunday. And up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose victorious o'er the last of men, and he lives forever. Oh, with his saints to reign. He's coming back. And the disciples watched him ascend, and were told by those angels, the same Jesus, oh, he's coming back again. And he's not coming back to go to the cross. This time he's coming to reign and rule, to right every wrong. And Zechariah tells us the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We say like John tonight as we look at our world with all of its sin and wickedness, you need to come by the way of the cross. We say like John in Revelation 22, Maranatha, even so, come, Lord Jesus. For these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We're going to sing that hymn of George Bernard's On a Hill Far Away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. We'll sing it through. Thank you.
let's give thanks for the food and also have the benediction. Lord, we thank thee for the cross. Thank you for what you accomplished. Burn it deep into our hearts and souls tonight that we never forget the debt that we owe. We thank thee for bringing us here, bring us to our homes in safety. Bless these refreshments. Bless those who have prepared them. Bless our fellowship together in the gospel. Now we say with the words of the Apostle Paul, finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.